Our next speaker is uh, C.J. Martello, uh, a correspondent for the Franoi, uh, a, uh, a descendant of uh, Mario uh, Avignone, uh, who wrote the Petals from Roseland column. Uh, C.J. has uh, been very active in the uh, Pullman community. Uh, in fact, he is a, an actor and portrays George Pullman uh, in his, his other life. And uh, uh, he has uh, worked with us at Casa Italia on many projects. And we're uh, very uh, pleased to have him uh, present uh, material about his book, Petals from Roseland, uh, uh, which was published recently. And uh, I understand it's been a wild success among the Roselandites in the Chicago area. Uh, C.J. Martello. Thank you, Dominic. Good morning, everyone. As Dominic mentioned, I've been a correspondent for Franoi Magazine, publishing, writing the Petals from Roseland column. Uh, I've been correspondent for them for over a decade now. And the book I have recently published is Petals from Roseland, The Fond Memories of Chicago's Roseland, Pullman, and Kensington Neighborhoods, which are uh, basically about the Italian Americans growing up in those neighborhoods and about how they uh, assimilated into the neighborhood and the great memories of that neighborhood of Roseland. The book is a compilation of the best of my 10 years of my columns. And the book took me 10 years to write the columns, but four years to write the book. By that, I mean it may be a compilation of 10 years of columns, but it is additionally took me four years to select the columns, put the book together, edit it, and decide how to publish it. And finally, wait for a bolt of lightning to strike to make me get into action. One of the things that kept me propelled towards the goal of completing my book was a daily vision of the affirmations I had posted on a wall in my house. Every day I'd see these affirmations and repeat them to myself. The one thing I want to state is that the affirmations are not a for immediate action. Affirmations are more of a support system to keep your deeper mind pro processes reminding of your goals and capabilities to eventually come to fruition. As I said, I saw those affirmations, but it still took me four years to get to the point where I published my book. Uh, one of the things um, I've noticed my goal was uh, to get this column to give life to the Italian heritage of the Italian Americans that grew up in Chicago's Roseland community. Well, one thing I forgot to tell you is what my affirmations were. So I have a poster on the wall that says, who's in charge? I am. Who can make it happen? I can. Through the grace of whom? Through the grace of God. In a world where you can be anything, be yourself. And now that I've published my book, it really makes a smile come to my face when I read those affirmations. Because though it took four years, I did accomplish my goal, which I say is to uh, give life to the Italian American heritage and the community we grew up in. And the column's been in existence since the 1950s, as Mar uh, Dominic mentioned, Mario Avignone began the column at the request of Father Purini of uh, Villa Scalabrini fame. And uh, as he got older, he stopped writing the column, but they continued to publish re repeats of the column for five years. But when uh, Mario moved into uh, the soldier, they were looking for a new author for the column, and I was selected. And my first thought was that I needed to get sources. So I uh, immediately stopped on the south side because I lived on the south side of Chicago for 41 years. So I immediately stations such as the Veneti del Mundo, which was populated by many Roseland people. And also I joined a group called the Spaghettios. And Spaghettios are a group of uh, Roselandites that were mostly Italian. And it started with a group that would meet for dinner at a local restaurant for Wednesday night spaghetti dinners. And someone moved to Arizona and when they wrote back, they said, Oh, tell the SpaghettiOs, I said hello. So that's how SpaghettiOs got their name. 
that group has been a great resource of information for me about the Benetton El Mundo and the Order Sons of Italy, because there's members from Roseland involved in all three of those groups. So I was able to glean information. I had interviews with many people through the, uh, throughout the years, and they formed the basis for my stories. One of the important things when I would get sources and hear stories was to listen to the stories, but not repeat them because I couldn't be sure how true, real they were. But then I would interview somebody else about the same age bracket, and they would repeat the story to me, and that would be the affirmation or the uh, uh, what I needed to support that story that I first heard. Then I could feel free to report. I was very fortunate to meet many people in their uh, 90s and a few in their 100s, and I learned right away that as soon as someone says, would you like to talk to someone, excuse me, a relative of mine who's 95 or 100 years old, I'd say yes, right away, because you never know how long they're going to be around. And so I would go ahead and interview them right away. And the bonus was that they got to read their interview with me. And that was a great uh, privilege for them and privilege for me also. Um, as I say, I jumped into it and joined these organizations for my resources and got all this information. Uh, my Italian was never so good, except I could understand my mother's dialect, the Veneto dialect, perfectly. But uh, I was asked to do the second reading in Italian at St. Anthony's 830 Mass, and that's definitely improved my Italian, and also got more people talking to me about my Italian background. And one of the things in joining St. Anthony's is that I became a parish council member. I excuse me, became an organizer for the different alumni events, uh, for the dinner dance. And so I met many more people who gave me information, which is very important when you're writing to get information. <coughs> excuse me. And even though I couldn't use all that information in my column or whatever, I still had it as a resource. I'll be using a lot of those references in my second book, which will be coming out eventually. As long as I keep looking at my affirmations. Um, uh, writing the monthly column isn't necessarily a chore that one has to deal with constantly, just once a month, right? Only 12 times a year. However, it does sometimes get the best of me when I'm exhausted or tired out from uh, any other things I have going on in my life. As Dominic mentioned, I do a one-man show, George Pullman, The Man and His Model Town, which has been very successful. So it's a matter of calling on my inner strength to just sit down on my computer and start writing. And I've come to recognize that that's the way it goes. You know, you can't say, oh, I'm going to sit down and write. You don't. You just think about it, and then you get to the point where, okay, I got to do it. So that's how that works. But uh, it's an interesting personal process for me uh, because I might have an idea in mind, or I might sit down without an idea, and just a sentence will pop into my head or a group of words will come to me. And then I take it from there and run with it. And being a wordsmith puts me in a good place to achieve flow, which is when I'm able to sit down and start writing without thinking about getting up, getting something to eat, getting something to drink, or getting up for any reason, I just continue to write. And flow will usually get me through two to four hours without any problem with the completion of my monthly column. Uh, when it came time to publish my book, I know I didn't want to reinvent the wheel. I always figure if someone has done something before me, I don't need to start from the bottom and redo the pitfalls they've survived. I, rec I recall a friend of mine who owned Lake Claremont uh, Press and decided to contact her for advice. Uh, fortunately for me, she had moved to Milwaukee and gotten out of the publishing business. That's when uh, it was very fortunate that she chose a new business as a consulting for publishing, for authors seeking to publish their works. So we worked together very well, and her fee was very reasonable. And the biggest benefit was that I avoided all the speed bumps a novice in the publishing arena falls victim to on the road to publishing their book. So I was able to ask someone with over a quarter century of experience in publishing questions any novice would ask, and I got answers. Some did I didn't like outright, 
and some I wasn't sure of, but I'll tell you what, the goal was accomplished. My book was published last December, and I've gone through my first printing of 500 copies, and I'm working on my second printing of 200 copies. The book has received great reviews. Uh, many thanks from the uh, people for the wonderful memories that it has kept alive. I've even had people call me up and one woman said, every time I read the stories in your book, I start to cry because it touches their hearts. And people have mentioned that they're so pleased with the book because it represents their Italian American childhood and the memories that they grew up with. They mentioned the important contribution the book is making to keeping alive the Italian American heritage so that they can pass it on to their children and their grandchildren. In other words, the book has accomplished my goal of keeping alive our Italian American heritage. And uh, my second book is in the works and uh, that will deal with an episode of the internment of Italian Americans uh, in American concentration camps during World War II. And my second book, I will be seeking a publisher rather than taking the self-publishing path that I did with Petals from Rosen, Fond Memories of Chicago's Rosen, Pullman, and Kensington Neighborhoods. And if anyone is interested uh, in receiving copies of the book or discussing it, I can be contacted at, at petalsfromrosen at gmail.com. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you, CJ. This is Anna. I'm, uh, we're ready to take questions from the audience. I do have one question from Peter Perro. He asks, what factors caused Italians to abandon Roseland and where did the majority disperse and resettle? Thank you, Peter. Well, thanks. Thank you, Peter. Uh, nice to hear from you. Uh, the Italians in Roseland, um, they were the Italian Americans. Uh, the older Italians went wherever their children thought would be best for them. So a lot of them moved to the south suburbs, uh, mainly uh, South Holland, uh, early on, and then Frankfurt, New Lenox, out north, southwest. But um, they've uh, joined clubs like the Veneti del Mondo or Order Sons of Italy in order to keep their Italian heritage alive. Uh, I know for a fact that they shop at Rubino's and D&D &D Italian Foods. Uh, they do whatever they can because, you know, I've written about this in my column. Chicago, I've been, my son is a Navy officer, so I've traveled around the world and around the country visiting him. And the one unfortunate thing about Chicago is we really don't have a little Italy anymore. San, San Diego does, San Francisco does, but Chicago doesn't. <clears throat> so by going to the Italian galleries and grocery stores, this is how they keep their Italian heritage alive. But they, uh, there's plenty of Italians here in Pullman, I must say. Any other questions? Yes, I do see a couple more questions. Um, it says, writing is much about flow, and it is flow which arouses feelings, empathy, and pathos, because the story sounds real. When you wrote the story, did you take into consideration a comparison between Veneto, past and present? Uh, between the Veneto? Uh, yes, actually, between, between Veneto, past and present. Actually, um, my uh, August column is going to deal with the differences in the dialects between the areas and the Veneto. And um, because I was just there in October, I went to my family is uh, from Rowana and uh, up by Asiago. So I was up there and my cousins from Trieste joined me there. And we went on the family tour of the cemeteries. But um, the Veneto now has changed completely because it depopulated. Uh, and uh, there was a big spur and spurt in buying uh, vacation properties in Italy. So in um, Asiago, there's a lot of places that are now for sale because of the recession um, had, they had a turn down. And the Italian government started taxing their vacation properties as though they were residential properties year round. And so a lot of people are selling those properties. What's so having uh, negative effect on the area. But if you'd like to buy a home in Veneto, you can feel free to go right ahead because there's a lot for sale. I and then see, you have other questions here. I do see another question. It says, you did say that Italian immigrants were in camps in the US during World War II. 
All right, so on the West Coast, uh, we're all familiar with the name Joe DiMaggio. Well, one of the restrictions from uh, um, the ruling in 9066, uh, which was put out by the government, they created zones where en enemy aliens could not go. Enemy alien was described as someone who was not a naturalized citizen. And Joe DiMaggio's father and family had a restaurant. Couldn't go because it was on the other side of the street and his father was an enemy alien. So he couldn't cross over to even go to the family restaurant. But many Italians who had boats, their boats were taken away from them because the Coast Guard needed them to protect the coast. And at the end of the war, they were giving the boats back. But many Italians uh, had restrictions such as curfew at night and they had to uh, defend against, um, defend against. They had to be wary about being out late. They had always carried the papers with them to prove that they were citizens. And if you were an enemy alien without your citizen paper, they made you move from the zone you were in to uh, miles away to another town. And you had to find, you'd leave your job to go to another job. So internment was, uh, for Italians, was uh, something that would last it for a good six months to a year. When that World War II and Italy got involved, through a ship in the harbor with Italian crews, all those Italian crews became POWs and they were put in camps also. So uh, it's a, some uh, Italian Americans don't realize that intermen even occurred with Italians, but it was a terribly stressful time because a lot of people didn't bother to get their naturalization papers because why would they need them? You know, they didn't have to speak Italian. They lived in an Italian neighborhood. So everybody spoke Italian. You know, they loved Italy and they loved America. You know? And one of the things, uh, interesting thing, when we went to war with the Italy, they used to, from due to World War I, there was a Combatini. And Combatini was the one uh, organization that collected money for the widows and orphans of World War I soldiers. And Americans or Italians in America donated money to this. They had clubs, they had organizations, and that was their main goal to support these widows and orphans. But as soon as the war started, World War II, boom, those people became enemies. Anybody in those organizations became suspect of the FBI. So some of those are the ones that got arrested and turned, uh, interviewed and taken away from their families. If you were out after curfew, you got taken away. Uh, they never told you where. You were uh, subject to being interviewed, they called it, and returned to your family whenever they felt like letting you go. So, yes, thanks, uh, CJ. Uh, yeah. I'm holding up a book. Uh, this is uh, uh, the latest uh, composite of uh, information about Italians, uh, Italian Americans. It's the Rutledge History uh, of Italian Americans. It's got uh, uh, 40 or 50 different articles in it. Uh, one of the articles is about Italians in World War II, uh, authored by me. But uh, this is sort of the state of the art of, uh, of uh, uh, scholarship on all subjects Italian American. And um, uh, thanks uh, for your presentation, CJ. Yeah.